Hello, welcome to another Cosmology Talk. This week we have Simone Ayola, who is a researcher at the Center for Computational Astrophysics at the Flatiron Institute in New York. He'll be talking today about the recent ACT data release. He's one of those in charge of one of the two cosmology papers. This particular data release will be one of the last stage three CMB results. And I, I guess the CMB doesn't need an introduction to cosmologists. It's really useful for cosmology and any measurement of the CMB brings all sorts of very valuable information about the early universe, the late universe, and the evolution between those two epochs. So thanks, Simone, for coming along. Do you want to briefly tell us about your work and the recent ACT results? Yeah, so we recently put out what we call the uh, data release number four for ACT, which includes a good variety of raw data in terms of uh, CMB maps in temperature and polarization that are available for, for the community, all the way to putting out cosmological results and likelihoods associated to those results constrain cosmological parameters, especially in, in Lambda CDM. These results that are presented today are uh, described in two papers, but uh, a lot of other science has already been posted on the archive, and in the next few months, people should be watching out more on the archive for more uh, active results on lensing clusters and, and all sorts of things. If a few months from now people are looking back at this talk and, and the papers that you're talking about, and they've forgotten everything except for two things, what would those two things you want them to still have in their mind be? I think the, the, the first part is that if you combine the large-scale information from WMAP together with the small-scale information that ACT can measure very well, you get a cosmological constraints that are at a precision that is comparable to the one from Planck. And that has been very hard to beat uh, until this point. Added to that, since we have our error bars to be comparable to ones from Planck, we can provide a version of Lambda CDM that is independently measured from Planck and so provide a cross-check. And I guess the big result or you know, the, the big take home message that I have is that if either Planck or ACT have residual systematics effects in their data, perhaps unlikely, but if they do, those are unlikely are gonna be changing cosmology at all. They are different telescopes. They live in different parts of the universe. One is in space, one is on the ground. And so systematics are likely to be very different and we find results that are completely in agreement. So I think that the Lambda CDM results from CMB with all the caveats that come in are robust. I guess if we've got a rare sky that's done something a bit funny, both would be measuring that. Yeah, so we do measure the same picture, right? We have one sky. So yeah, if anything comes from a statistical fluke because we observe one universe, yeah, that we won't be able to answer that question. Now, if you want to go into some background, obviously the CMB doesn't need too much of a motivation as to why it's interesting, but why is ACT interesting? Why is it telling us stuff that we couldn't just get from Planck? Yeah, no, exactly. I, I think that ACT as an experiment, of course, the, the main goal is mapping the CMB at very high resolution. And that is not just about primordial CMB. It's really interesting to do all sorts of science in terms of lensing, but also the Snellens and Dovich effect, finding clusters, measuring their thermal snellens dovich effect and the kinetic snellens dovich effect, and of course, point sources. We observe tons of point sources at a multiple frequencies, and so you can constrain populations. So what we call CMB secondaries and foregrounds, those provide very interesting science that is not possible to do with telescopes that are much smaller than they don't have enough resolution. Of course, this comes to the expenses of not being in space and so not be able to cover the entire sky, but from Chile, as I was mentioning before, you can cover basically half of the sky, including some galaxies. So we're really happy that we put these maps out and we'll continue to maps out for the community because if you have other interests and you simply want microwave data on a given location of the sky, those are now available. And number counts in terms of clusters and point sources starts to become important. So we're going that direction. Cool. So now do you want to get into the details of what was new in the recent paper? Just want to take one second to really highlight the entire collaboration. I'm presenting on behalf of all these people and you know, to run some, something like ACT, you need amazing people that can build a telescope and uh, acquire data and analyze data and do all sorts of science with it. So this is very much work from the entire collaboration. And for people that are interested in digging more into the papers, all the results I'll be presenting are basically described in two papers that we posted on the archive. And these people are sort of the people that really focus on these two analysis. So you can ask all the questions you like. So the results, let me show you a quite amazing picture of ACT, I think. ACT as a six meter primary mirror. It's very big. And then here you see the secondary. So light goes from primary to secondary and here you have the receiver. And this big mirror really is the main thing that allows you to go to very fine scales onto the sky. And 
when you compare it with Planck, that big mirror really gives you a high resolution. So here you see a resolution increasing from left to right. You see that ACT is an Archimedes resolution experiment and is, as we mentioned before, comparable to, to SPT. The big new thing for ACT, in a sense, is that we are now covering almost 40% of the sky. Of course, we sort of migrated, we did small patches, but now we're going to very wide sky areas. And those are very important for cosmology for all sorts of reasons. And that's how we compare with satellite experiments. Of course, we are not in space, so we can't cover 100% of the sky. We could get very close though. And bigger meter, that means higher resolution. And so you see that Planck is around seven arc minutes at 150 gigahertz, whereas we get to 1.4 roughly. So that has a lot of different scales. And so just want to mention what kind of data set we use for this analysis, as people might be interested for other purposes as well. All the data here is from ACTBOL. And that's data that was taken starting in 2013, all the way to the end of 2016. And the big difference between ACTPOL and sort of the previous version of ACT is that now we can look at polarization of the sky as well. Uh, we're really used to temperature. And of course, Planck has measured and WM have measured polarization, but now we do this at a better level. And one big thing that has happened for us in 2016 is that we switched to observing 40% of the skies, as I mentioned before. And just a quick note on this, covering large fractions of the sky is sort of the baseline that things like the Simons Observatory or CMBS4 are assuming to do cosmology from Chile. You want a big telescope that covers a lot of the sky to do things like neutrino mass. So trying this out is non-trivial and we really wanted to do it with that. And so with these data sets, we can constrain cosmology fairly well and we're still observing today and we'll, we'll continue observing for, for a few more years. What are all of these PA1, PA2, PA3 things? Yeah, good point. The telescope has three cameras. So you have a big cryostat that pulls these cameras down, but you have three independent optic tubes, if you want, uh, with three dependent cameras. So we installed three covering 150 gigahertz. And then the last one was actually able to observe at 150 gigahertz and 90 gigahertz as well. And then in 2016, the first advanced act camera was installed instead of PA1. And this actually, I mentioned this later, this is useful because it basically gives you cross checks. The optics are slightly different. They are located in different locations of the telescope. And so you can really cross check the data. Cosmology should be invariant under different optic tubes. And so th there was a non-trivial test to do with our data. And are you only recording with the one or two frequencies then? We have data 90 uh, gigahertz, uh, 98 gigahertz and 150 gigahertz. Asking a super naive theorist question, but does that make it difficult to remove foregrounds? The more frequencies you have, the better. In terms of foregrounds at high L, uh, 19150 do a very good job at constraining things like the, the CAB component and uh, point sources. We can use data from Planck high frequency, 353 gigahertz to look at dust, and low frequency to look at synchrotron emission. And we do use 220 gigahertz data in temperature from the previous version of ACT, what we call MBAC, to help constraining that foreground on the high L tail. But that's one of the reasons why now we're running ACT at five frequencies, ranging from 30 all the way to 220 gigahertz, because that will improve our foreground modeling. So just being deliberately very skeptical, you say that your data is independent of Planck's. Is that completely true? If the 350 gigahertz Planck data was the one that had the systematic and you've used it also to remove your foreground, is that a possible source of the same data in the two experiments? Yeah, so CMB channels are between, you know, 90 and 150 gigahertz, basically, and I guess the 217 from, from Planck. High frequencies have basically no CMB component in there. They're mostly foregrounds. And the way we use it is in cross-correlation with ACT to see if we can detect any dust contamination. And if we do, that provides a template that we can marginalize over in the likelihood or remove it in the power spectrum. I should say any foreground contamination is also very small compared to the CMB signal at the CMB frequencies. I would say that if there were to be a systematic in the high frequency Planck data that will likely not affect cosmology at a level that will make us consistent with Planck or not consistent with Planck. Hi, yeah, just jumping in now later on while I'm editing. I wasn't completely satisfied with my understanding of Simone's answer there. The reason I was asking these questions is I remembered the BICEP2 situation where they thought they had this amazing signal and it turned out that they hadn't gotten the foregrounds right and it was because they only had one frequency. So that's why I was going down that line. And then when it turned out that he was saying that the way that they modeled things like dust, they used Planck, it, it sort of then thinks that like, well, okay, saying you're independent from Planck is a problem. But he gave a really satisfying answer afterwards, like after I'd stopped recording. So you can't see his answer. So I'm just gonna have to paraphrase it myself. But essentially the foregrounds that are really relevant to 
act because they're looking at the smaller scales are things like point sources. And things like point sources, you don't need multiple frequencies. Whereas the stuff like dust is relevant on the larger scales, but those larger scales aren't what ACT is getting most of its constraining power from. Whereas BICEP 2, they were looking at larger scales. So hopefully that's satisfying to you. It was satisfying to me, but I wasn't recording Simone when he gave me that answer. So any incorrectness is my fault, not his. This is our footprint. Here we are in equatorial coordinate. That's why the, the galaxy looks not horizontal, as you usually see in a Planck map, for example. And you see that we cover, as I mentioned before, roughly 17,000 square degrees. We build this survey over the years and we start uh, with small patches and then we grow the footprint on the sky as, as times goes. And we really cover this last part, the big part, only uh, in 2016. So this part is still very shallow, but we're building more signal to noise there with the integration time. And, you know, if, if people are interested in, in numbers, I guess that the, the two numbers that uh, can give you an idea with uh, comparison with Planck is that if you look at the noise level of the 153 gigahertz Planck channel uh, average over the, all, the whole sky, uh, our maps have a noise over 4,000 square degrees that is better than this number. You, and you can see it here basically. And if you go at smaller frequency, 100 gigahertz channel, our 98 is better, again, compared to the whole sky average uh, over 9,000 square degrees. So again, we're getting very deep and we have a lot more resolution. Uh, compared to Planck. So what's cool about ACT, which is, you know, then motivates all this, the analysis that we've done is that uh, we make SIMB maps and the, those are released, you can see them. And here on the left-hand side, you see a temperature map from ACT. This is slightly filtered just to see really the scales that, that we measure. Probe-wise, what is this showing you is, is basically the density, a picture of the density fluctuations at the scattering surface. But now with ACT, we also measure polarization at very high signal to noise. And here you see on the right hand side, a picture of the E mode map. So the polarization of the same. And assuming that the physics that generates these two is the same, what you're, what you're seeing here is the velocity field of that uh, plasma at the last scattering surface. So it's giving you sort of two different points of view of, of the same physics at the last scattering surface. And so they, they, it gives you two different ways to measure cosmology given this data set. And Planck has measured them before, and here you see the main difference. When you add Planck to ACT, you see that Planck can measure the, the very large scale very well. That's why you see these large scale fluctuations in temperature. And so there is a part that ACT cannot measure at all. That's the very large scales on the sky, but ACT and Planck does that very well, and WMAP does the same. Then we have an intermediate range of scales where ACT and WMAP provide an independent measurement of the same picture of the sky, of the same Cosmo. Uh, and then, of course, ACT is adding a lot more information on small scales that Planck was not able to add because of resolution. And if you do the same game in, in polarization, you really see that even if you try to add uh, Planck, you cannot see a big change in the polarization map. And that's because we are going a lot deeper. And now we can really see the polarization of this MB, which is in terms of powers a lot dimmer than, than the temperature. And so, of course, Planck has a beautiful measurement of the power spectrum of the e polarization, but now we are showing this in uh, in map domain as well, uh, and we're very much used to seeing a lot of temperature maps from Planck and W map. Now we're getting to the regime where you can actually see these maps in polarization as well. Just a quick question about the ACT plus Planck temperature. I'm a little confused because ACT has obviously measured that piece of the sky, and so my understanding was that what Planck had over ACT was that it would be measuring temperature fluctuations on even larger scales than, than this particular size. Why is Planck giving any information about scales that are within that square? So here is only a cutout of that square. We measure a lot more. Here I just pick a cutout so that we can see the fluctuations. But Planck is measuring over the whole sky very large fluctuation from L equals 2 to L equals 2,000. Whereas ACT is measuring fluctuation on half of the sky on small scales covering L of 600 down to L of 8,000. So that's why th these big fluctuations, those are above one degree. And that's why you see them from Planck because Planck is measuring these large scales fluctuation. So is the issue that ultimately ACT measures a temperature along a bunch of lines of sight. And, and then when you process that to get the temperature fluctuations, you have more noise on these larger scales and therefore, when you're showing the act alone, you've filtered out that noise. And then when you add the plank in, you've unfiltered it. That's right. 
So this is a window filter. So here the filter basically says, if I have fluctuations that have a signal to noise greater than one, I'm gonna show them. Uh, otherwise they're done weighted. And, and that's fine. If you wanna do temperature fluctuations on large scales, you probably wanna go to space. Polarization, I sh we should say, uh, the atmosphere is not polarized. So you could in principle access very large scale polarization features uh, from the ground just fine. So here I'm showing you a cutout of these two maps, but uh, as I mentioned, we, we cover a lot more. And so, as I said before, we started this new campaign of covering 40% of the sky. And then, of course, when you spend a lot of time covering a lot of sky, the depth of the map improves a lot slower, as you would expect. And so here, in, in this data release, we only include one year of this wide region. And so what you see here is that the depth over the map is very different. You have some very deep regions in dark yellow, and you have some shallower regions in blue. And so because of that, your analysis is slightly more complicated at this stage. It will get better as you integrate down and you make that patch very uniform. But for this analysis to make it robust and understand uh, all the results, basically of these 17,000 square degrees that we cover, we cut out 11,000 square degrees. And those are the black contours that you see. Those are all the different patches that we cut out and we, we take the power spectra of. And then if you want to compute the effective sky area, because when you have some noisy parts of the sky, those will weight or contribute less to the, the power spectrum. So if you want a single number to say what's the effective sky, well, that's roughly 5,400 square degrees, which is still a factor of 10 bigger than our previous data release, roughly. So we are improving, and with the years, this will become a lot more uniform, and we will approach this effective sky area to basically uh, you know, go very close to the 17,000 square degrees. Of course, we will need to mask the galaxy. Uh, but so with this number in hand, and with the fact that the, the depth of the map is very is variable across the sky, this made us divide the data set in two parts. One that we call deep, and I'm mentioning this because I'll show you some of these consistency tests that we do, and you'll see deep and wide show up a few times. Uh, one to be the deep data set, which basically includes spectra that were computed using the dark orange regions and the white data set that includes these bluer and light yellow regions, shallower regions. And here you see a somewhat weird table, uh, but the, the, the point that I wanna make here with this table is that, as I was mentioning before, we have different optic tubes and we, offer, uh, we observe uh, several of the patches multiple times over different years. And so this builds in a way to test data to make sure that, again, cosmological results are uh, invariant uh, if you compute them for different arrays, or across different seasons. And so this builds in a lot of consistency tests uh, we can do and are, they take basically an entire paper to describe all the tests that we've done and the fact that our data looks consistent internally uh, without looking at Planck at all. So uh, when we take spectrum, this is basically the measurement. If you compress the information of those maps in, into power spectra, here you see the temperature fluctuations. So the temperature power spectrum at 98 and 150. And actually, we also compute the 98 cross 150 that here is not shown just for clarity. Uh, and then you see the EE power spectrum. And then you see the cross correlation of the two when you cross correlate the temperature and the multipolarization map. And uh, as I was mentioning before, you see that here we go down to, you know, L of roughly 350. But in temperature, actually, we, we stop at 600 for our cosmological analysis. So we from 600 and above. And for polarization, we go from 350 and above. So Dublin up and plan really add a lot at scales that are uh, much larger than this that we don't we don't measure. Um, and here I'm showing you the power spectrum from the deep patches. And then I can move to the wide. And one thing that you should take away from this is that uh, as far as polarization is concerned, uh, things don't move, and that's what you would expect. The results should be uh, independent of which part of the sky you're looking at. The only difference that you'll notice is on the tail. And this is expected because when you have a shallower region or shallower patch, making sure that you're actually removing a point source, it's a lot harder. So for the wide region, our flux cut for point sources is 100 millijensky, uh, and that gives you a higher residual tail at high L, uh, whereas for the deep one is 50 millijensky. And so this difference is just because we remove more point sources in deep versus wide. So it's totally expected, and that's what you should see. But you know where the cosmology matters, which are the acoustic peaks, uh, things don't really vary. So can you just talk me through why there's a difference between 98 and 150 gigahertz on the small scales? This is also due to uh, sources. So most of the, the brightest sources are synchrotron sources. So you would expect them to be brighter in 98 than 150 gigahertz. Those are by far the brightest. And so that's why the tail is, is different 98 and 150. It's just because of foreground. 
not. Is it not possible to kind of estimate the foregrounds and remove them and then have larger error bars and blah, 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 and have the two lines on top of each other? Yeah, that's the next one. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah, yeah no, no, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. So I agree with you. We have foregrounds. We need to model them and remove, but ideally you would like to have a data set that is clean from foregrounds. And so you can do that at the power spectrum level. You can actually combine all this information and the multi-frequency data to get to this. Here you see the temperature for the, uh, the deep uh, in dark blue, the wide in light blue, and we also add, to show consistency, the resulting temperature from MBAC, the 2008-2010 data that I, that I mentioned before. And so here you can see now you lose the, the frequency information here. And then you see T and EE. The point that I want to make with this plot, though, is that if you look at in this regime, you see that error bars, they're very tiny when you go wide. And actually, you can see that even better in EE, you see that for the white patch, the error bars on intermediate scales uh, below 1500 are smaller than the deep patch, whereas what the deep does well is to constrain the foregrounds. And so the point here is that if you want to constrain lambda CDM, and we, we, which really means looking at these oscillations, going wide is the thing that is helping us improve upon the previous results and be comparable to Planck. Right, so again, this is deep and wide. You can simply combine them. And here I just want to show a status of the field as of July 2020. Hopefully we haven't left anyone out. But here you can see the temperature from uh, all the points from ACT are in red. Uh, you see the information from Planck. Of course, here there is also WMAP, but uh, it's not shown. There is SPT, polar bear, and bicep. And you see that these measurements are just beautiful. We seem to agree all very well. And in the next few years, we will improve our signal to noise to really map out also the remote power spectrum. But as far as this cosmological analysis is concerned, the only data that we use from ACT is TT, EE, and T power spectrum. So let's get to the cosmology. We've done a ton of tests. And so this is a very colorful plot, but basically what I want to show is that here each of the rows are the six lambda CDM cosmological parameters. And here from black to yellow, this first part shows you the derived parameters when you cut the data in different ways. And of course you do expect these parameters to oscillate just because of random fluctuation due to, due to noise. And the gray box are indicating the expectation from random fluctuation. So if you see that a point that is a lot farther away from the allowed region, that would indicate that the amount of the parameter shift is actually not compatible with just random fluctuation, but there is something there that has gone wrong. And the dashed line is the baseline, which is when you include everything. Yeah, the, the, our baseline is basically act with temperature above 600 and polarization above 350. Uh, in multiples. And so you, you can see that they're, they're basically consistent. We also look at constraints from temperature, polarization, and polarization only. And I guess one of the cool things you can see here is that now some of the cosmological parameters are actually being constrained by TE a lot better than TT. And this is nice because foregrounds act in different ways on, in polarization. And this is going to give us basically an independent and almost independent estimate of cosmological parameters from polarization only. Uh, of course, EE is not there yet. We will get there in the future. But, you know, this regime is, is pretty cool to see. Uh, we also check for consistency across frequencies. You might expect something to go wrong with foregrounds, for example, and deep and wide. And in general, the take-home message is that everything is very stable. And for the very low h naught, you can try to look at different splits of the data. It's very much stable and fluctuations are within errors. So we've done a lot of tests and we think that our data set looks okay. We don't have any evidence of systematic effects. And so we then combine everything together and we come up with a cosmology. And so in this, the usual triangular plot here shows the six lambda CDM parameters plus the two derived, H0 and sigma 8, from WMAP only, Planck, and ACT. And I should say that these three data sets have, have in common just a tau prior. But just to make sure that we are comparing apples to apples, we, we run all the chains with the same tau prior. And so what you can see is that these data sets are broadly consistent. Lambda CDM keeps to be a good fit for the ACT data. Uh, we don't see any evidence of you know, departure from Lambda CDM. Uh, it's, it's just a good fit. And we also try to estimate the consistency of these uh, three data sets in the full five-dimensional parameter space. And here I'm saying five-dimensional because, as I said, tau is a prior. Uh, so that would be in common with, with all of them. And so if you look at the five-dimensional hypervolume, ACT is consistent with WMAP and Planck at a level that goes between 2.3 and 2.7 sigma. 
And if you look uh, at uh, you know, the parameters, they broadly look consistent. The, the generacies look consistent as well, uh, which is you would expect. The only degeneracy that sort of uh, catches your eye is this one, which again is expected. But you see that if you use large scale information, if you want to increase NS, you need to also increase omega B to make sure that the first peak is within measurements. Whereas if you use high L information, uh, the degeneracy is the opposite. If you increase NS, you need to decrease omega B. And that's because the way uh, these two parameters are acting on the peaks. So these two degeneracies are expected. Increasing NS would give me more power on the small scales, right? Yeah, and, and this, that's the same that happens if you increase omega B on small scales. Why is that exactly? Yeah, I can quickly share this with a super preliminary plot I made before this talk. Okay, cool, thanks. Uh, so here I have values of omega B uh, H squared. And here you see that for higher values, the tail gets boosted. Also, the first peak gets boosted. So here you have an overall boost of the fluctuations. Whereas for NS, the interesting point is that for NS, the pivot scale is around the second peak. And so what happens is that higher NS does give you a boost at the high L, but also suppresses the first peak. And that's why you see these degeneracies. Yeah, so, so the omega baryon thing is not that it has a funny effect at the small scales. It's just doing the same thing on all scales. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's expected. Uh, it's just, uh, and this was seen by, by, by Planck as well. So although these, these two degeneracies are different and the, the, the difference is expected, they're not consistent at the one sigma level. And you may ask, where is this 2.3, 2.7 sigma coming from? Most of the discrepancy comes really from this plane. And I guess you can see from the fact that these two ellipses that do not act, and as well as with Planck, uh, they don't fully overlap. Again, this is less than three sigma. With the amount of data that we have right now, we can't say much. And I'll try to comment on this a little bit later. But we think that you know these three data sets are consistent, and we feel entitled in uh, basically combining double map and act. Uh, again, this is a discrepancy in the in a five dimensional volume is not for a single parameter. So if you agree with the fact that we can combine them, I mean even if one doesn't agree, it's still interesting to see what happens. Yeah, so we do it, and then go ahead, combine them. Exactly, we we do combine them, and here you see the the results from act and double map. That's actually what we call our baseline to compare with Planck. And again, this, this should be the baseline because you, know, you can compare ACT and Planck separately as we've done in the previous plot. But if you really wanna give an independent measurement, the amount of scales that you need to include in your analysis should be comparable uh, between Planck and the, different, and the other data set. And so you really need WMAP for large scale information. And so you can see that as soon as we add WMAP, uh, we break some of the degeneracies that were in the two data sets independently double map and act and overall we get beautiful consistency again with error bars that are at this point are very uh, much comparable with uh, the one from Planck and you can see that even if we add information from act to Planck we don't improve a lot and that's expected in lambda CDM Planck has basically saturated information we're going to be improving on polarization only in the future but if you consider temperature and polarization combined at this stage Planck has saturated all the information and so we don't see a big shift the fact that they're consistent, though, shows that ACT is not pulling Planck away in any direction. So those that, that extra information on the small scales is not having that big of an, an effect then? That seems surprising to me. For Lambda CDM, again, so when we add to WMAP, that WMAP basically has information up to L of 1,000, of course, we improve a lot because of ACT. But then when you add ACT to Planck, in Lambda CDM, measuring a, a bunch of other small scale modes actually doesn't help a lot because uh, most of the peaks are already well mapped out by Planck, basically. What it really adds if you go beyond Lambda CDM, where the dumping tail is the thing that matters, and so beyond Lambda CDM, data sets like ACT is, are going to be improving on Planck. Yeah, I guess the spectral index might be the one thing I'd expect it to have. And, and looking at your plot, that's the one thing that actually does shift a tiny bit. Yeah, and as I mentioned before, ACT does prefer a cosmology that has less damping. And so we do see that in those parameter constraints. Again, at, at a level that is less than three sigma, so it's really hard to draw any conclusion right now. Um, and so uh, cosmology is very consistent. And then if we focus on H naught, we also get very similar result, actually well within one sigma. And here you can see that, actually you can see better from this plot, what really what we really measure to, uh, to measure H0 is the location of these peaks uh, of the acoustic oscillations. And that gives a constraint on the theta parameter, which is basically the ratio 
of RS, and here it's, it's written in terms of R drag, but it's basically the same within a few megaparsec versus DA. And so here is, you know, you have an integral over the early time physics from, you know, the, the beginning to the last cutting surface. And here you have an integral over the expansion history from the last cutting surface to us. And so the idea is that these peaks are measured very well. And so if you play with new cosmological models, the idea is that you need to keep the angle fixed because that's well measured. And so you will need to change RS and DA in such a way that keeps that angle fixed. And here you sort of see in that plot where there is a dependence between uh, R drag or RS and H naught. And if you would like to be in a better agreement with, for example, measurement from the supernova, what you really need to do is to increase that RS parameter, which really means increasing also the distance to the last cutting surface to keep the, the theta constant. And you can do that only at the cost of lowering omega matter quite a lot in order to get in agreement with, with that H naught. And so from this, in general, if you look at the H naught plane, you know, act only, here you can see the constraint here, is in complete agreement with, with Planck uh, with an error bar of 1.5. When you add the large angular information from WAP, again, a very good agreement with an error bar of 1, uh, which uh, compares with an error bar of roughly 0.6 from, from Planck. And since we are in agreement with Planck, whatever tension was shown before uh, still holds true. Uh, we are in agreement within one sigma with Friedman's measurement of supernova and the tip of your giant uh, as a calibrator, and we have a rough equal sigma tension with, with Cephids. So this, th this is the, the main result. Of course, as I mentioned uh, before, ACT should be very good for extension to lambda CDM, so we, we, we took a glance of those. And here there are two main categories of extensions to lambda CDM that you can consider. One is sort of those extensions that affect the lensing, and so the smearing of the peaks, and one being, for example, omega k. And people have uh, alluded to the fact that Planck uh, power spectrum information was uh, preferring a, a value of omega k that was less than zero. And if you look at the ACT only and the ACT plus WMAP uh, power spectrum information, we have no preference for that. So this could be a, a statistical fluke. And in terms of neutrino mass, of course, we don't detect uh, any neutrino mass and everything keeps uh, to be nominal. Uh, we also look at sort of the category of primordial parameters that really affect the, the tilt uh, of the spectrum or uh, things like an effective that, you know, would change the photons, basically the, the, the plasma that are scattering surface. And again, everything looks nominal. Uh, we have a, you know, a slight preference for a value of an effective that to be less than three. And uh, we have a preference of a higher running, but I should mention that any of these things are within 1.5 to 2 sigma significance compared to expectation from lambda CDM. So we can't really say anything about this stuff. So yeah, everything looks nominal in a sense. And just to comment on one, which I haven't showed the distribution there, uh, we also look at a lens. This was one other parameter that was highly discussed in, in Planck. a lens for us is very much one. Uh, we don't see any departure. Do you want to, um, as briefly as, as you want to, explain what Aliens actually is? I'm not sure it's come up yet on the channel. Yeah, no, absolutely. So as I mentioned before, the, the power spectra, temperature, and polarization are affected by lensing. And what lensing does is creates a smearing of the peaks that otherwise will look sharper if you didn't have any lensing. And so you can introduce a phenomenological parameter that says, that measure this uh, lensing-like smearing of the peaks. Uh, and, and this was first used in 2008 to actually show a, a direct evidence of lensing in CMB data before actually det detecting lensing. And Planck has used this parameter to look at the smearing of the peaks and found a value that was higher than one, you would expect one in normal CDM at a level that was less than three sigma, roughly 2.8 sigma, with a, you know, an uncertainty that would, would change depending on how you do the analysis. And so people have alluded to the fact that that could be systematic effect in Planck that perhaps could then change H naught or, or just, you know, think about new physics and things like that. As I mentioned before, lambda CDM for us looks very similar to the one from, from Planck. And as specifically for ALANs, uh, we actually measure one. And so that could be a statistical fluke, the fact that we don't cover exactly the same amount of step that Planck does, or if it's a, a systematic effect in Planck, uh, we don't see it. And we basically show that that wouldn't affect H0 either, though. Would it affect the spectral index? Are those two things related? No, no, this is very much the peak smearing. So it's basically the ratio of the thrust and peaks. But not the actual overall height? 
yeah, I, I don't think, I'm, I'm not sure at very high L, to be honest with you, but uh, in terms of acoustic peaks, that should not affect an S. And I guess if you want, uh, since it's a lensing parameter, uh, you perhaps see that, as I mentioned before, also omega K is a lensing parameter. And here I'm just speculating, you could probably think that these two effects are, are related. Uh, we should look at the, you know, the, the genesis of these two, but um, we don't really see it. The reason I thought NS and AL might be related is that the amount of len lensing you expect is related to the amount of power on small scales, because if there's more power, there's more lensing happening. Yeah, good point. The easiest thing would be to actually look at the, the genesis and, and plot a lens with the, the overall triangular plot uh, and see if there are the genesis there. Of course, adding an extra parameter might actually introduce more the genesis there. And uh, yeah, you, you, do have a, you do have a good point. I, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I should mention that the likelihoods are online, but also the chains. So those, those sort of plots should be easy for the community to make in case you, you have any interest in that. So yeah, everything is within prediction, unfortunately, I should say, <laughs> uh, within 1.5 into sigma. And, and I think that if anyone wants to see any hint of something in, in this data here, I think that you know in the next couple of years when we add more data, they will either go away because maybe we find a systematic that we can remove now that we have more data. It would go away because it's statistical fluke and now we have more sky. Or if it stays there, it will become a five sigma thing. And I wish that is going to be true because that would be very interesting. But at the moment, with you know, all in total honesty, we cannot say anything like that. The last super quick point that I wanted to make since I mentioned it is this problem or problem, this, this you know, effect that we see in the NS omega B plane. And we can look at that at the power spectrum level. And you basically say, okay, well, ACT measures the scales here. And you may wonder what kind of cosmology, what kind of power spectrum does ACT predict on large scales that we don't measure? And here you can see that if you use ACT cosmology, because of NS and because that feature of the pivot scales be, be there, we basically miss the first peak. We have less power than you would, you would expect from Tablet at a level that is roughly 2.4 sigma. So we, we've done a, a quick test where we say, well, we have a very good measurement of the first peak. There is no reason to believe that the first peak is wrong because two independent experiments, Frank and Dabinop, measure it over many years and they find it to be very consistent. So if you put a, a very weak prior on the amplitude of the first peak, you see that our contours tend to go towards lower value of NS, moving in that direction that I mentioned before because of that, that the genesis that also Planck sees. And in general, uh, our best fit value wants a little bit of a higher TE and a bit of a lower EE power. It's very hard to think about something that gives you a higher TE, but a lower EE systematic wise. We try to play a little game where we say, okay, well, what happens if I only modify TE, the amplitude of TE? And so you see that if you change the amplitude of the TE power spectrum, you move that in, along the degenesis, and if you take basically a 5% you know, lower value of that power spectrum, lower um, overall amplitude, you, you go towards that direction. I should say that this is just an exercise though, because we have looked at things like leakage that will give you more TE power and things like that. We have no reason to believe that our data has contamination. So it's done there because we wanted to explore it, but we, we, don't, we don't believe that at this stage we have a systematic effect that we have not accounted for. And again, this is sort of a, a very trivial test to do, but if you want to come up with an instrumental model that does that, you will need to modify the EE power spectrum as well. And if you try really hard, that messes up your fit. So it's not easy to come up with something that actually changes TE and EE the same way to gain consistency. Can I just clarify something from my own understanding? The, the slightly higher TE and lower EE is a separate thing to the 2.4 lower sigma lower first peak and TT, or are they somehow related to each other? They're, they're connected because here you see basically the difference between the WMAP or Planck best fit compared to ACT. And so that's how it looks in TT lack of power at large scales, and that's how it looks in TE and E. So it's the same effect. So literally just a running of the spectral index would solve all three. That's right. I mean, obviously it would also be a huge deviation from lambda CDM that would be the most exciting thing to come out for a long time. Yeah, no, exactly. And we explore the running of the spectral index. And again, from ACT only, you can say you do want a higher than zero value of the running, but then as soon as you add Planck or WMAP, that actually goes really away. And that's important because adding large scale information really breaks some of the degeneracy. So that's why we believe in the combination with ACT and the WAP information. 
And so again, this is sort of the last slide that shows if you want to find something weird in the paper, that's it. We have no reason to believe that we have a systematic at this level. We may find a little bit more data. We think that our analysis is robust and any sigma level that you come up with is below three sigma. So it's really hard at this point to come up with, with something different. And nevertheless, the data is public, likelihoods, chains, maps, anything you would like to cross check. If you're a theorist that has you know, a new favorite beyond numbers CDM model and you want to check it with data, please do so and let us know what you find. Cool. So you, you have gone into this a bit already, but please feel free to go into to more detail. What comes next? So you said that ACT has some more cosmology papers coming out. What is it you're actually looking into if you're allowed to tell us? And you've mentioned that you're already taking advanced ACT. When, 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 when might the cosmological results of that data come? Yeah, so in terms of ACT DR4, uh, so papers are coming out uh, in the next few months. Uh, a lot of focus is gone on to, of course, reconstructing lensing. Uh, these surveys are fantastic for lensing. There is a lot of effort in terms of small scale physics, like point sources and, and clusters. Was actually, um, several results were shown as a preliminary result before, but now that we cover this big area of the sky, we can actually see a lot of clusters. And those are powerful for cosmology. So, you know, we're starting to be very competitive in terms of cluster counts and maximum redshift you can probe when compared to Planck, of course, because of the high resolution. And in the past, we've used multi-frequency information to reconstruct symbi-only and TZ-only maps, component-separated maps. Uh, so for DR4, it's mostly going to be lensing and cluster catalogs and cosmology-related analysis. In terms of future, yes, we are already analyzing and looking at maps that included up, uh, up to uh, 2020. And it's hard to give a date for when cosmology is going to come out of it because we did take a big step forward here and there were some analysis choices that we had to make to be able to analyze these big areas of the sky. But of course, as I mentioned before, now these things may become five sigma and that really means you need to pay attention even more to systematic effect and cross checks and things like that. So this data set is new. My expectation would be two years from now to say and, and a value could be a lot earlier than that because now some hurdles were, were passed since we have this data set analyzed, but we just put these papers out. So we, you know. You want a break. <laughs> so uh, hopefully two years and by the end of Advanced Act, I think that these constraints are gonna be very, very powerful with a lot more information on small scales that other experiments don't have. So, you know, usually you know, the rule of thumb is that you take two years up at the end of your project to say, that's when I publish all the results. Uh, so if Advanced Act ends in 2022, that roughly gives you 2024, 2025 to have the last data release from ACT. Of course, meanwhile, Simon's Observatory is coming online, so we will start working with that as well. Uh, and I guess a lot of work will start in parallel between the two experiments, and I think that uh, cosmology will come out the cross-correlation between SO and ACT. Because Planck was a powerful instrument to cross-check double map, now we believe that ACT was a powerful instrument to cross-check some of the scales from Planck that are in common, as so will do the same for ACT. Same resolution, same location on the planet. We will be able to dig uh, even more into systematics. When do we expect Simon's Observatory to first start taking data, or is it already taking data? No, it's not taking data. We, the site is under construction, the telescopes are under construction, and so things will happen really fast, modulo COVID. We expect, you know, first light from one of the telescopes should be sometime uh, in the next year or two actually more than next year. Starting full science operation, that might take a little longer because we do have four telescopes to put together and um, to deploy. Awesome. Okay, so the last question outside of your own research, what do you think is the most interesting thing in cosmology at the moment? Yeah, well, definitely gravity waves is one of those things that uh, make me feel the, you know, the general public that always looks after you and says, oh my God, this result is really cool because I don't, I don't have a, you know, I, I don't grasp everything 100%, but it's just very cool. And that's me with gravity waves. I mean, I, you know, I, I studied GR, uh, but I feel that, you know, it's, it's such just a, a new window on, on cosmology. And, you know, they have shown that they can in the future constrain things like H0 as well. And uh, I'm looking forward to, in general, multi-messenger, multi-wavelength analysis are powerful. And now adding gravity waves to the pool of friends that can work together. I think it's, it's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. It's literally the most common answer people give to this question, and I haven't yet had a talk on gravitational waves, so I'm, I'm starting to feel very guilty about that. So I'll put it on the agenda. <laughs>
Cool. Thanks everyone for watching. If you like this, don't forget to subscribe and click the bell to make sure you're notified and click like to help with the YouTube algorithms and share the channel with your, with your colleagues and collaborators. If you have any questions or suggestions, leave a comment. While you're here, you, you can watch another video. A little while ago, Omar Darwish from ACT gave a talk on how they construct their lensing map, which was really good. And thanks again, Simone, for the great talk today. Thank you.